appreciate all the work that goes into that. A lot of work goes into that rather than this contemporary garbage that's being put out. First Corinthians 15. I'm always kind of amazed how the Lord puts things together. That last song we sang goes right with the message. That goes right with the message. First Corinthians 15. Uh, this is a chapter about the resurrection. And I'd like to read the last five verses, and we're going to see a word repeated three or four times. So in verse 54, 1 Corinthians 15, 54. So, the, so when this corruptible shall put, have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. That's a nice word. It's that a nice word, victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of the sin of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you labor, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Okay, so let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I do pray you'd help each every one of us to um, experience the victory and the many victories that you have uh, in store and desire for each of your children. Help us to be conquering soldiers for Jesus Christ and help us to enjoy many victories. And the first and foremost is salvation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, a lot of times if you look at an age, there will be a spirit over an age. And the spirit over our age that you can see and witness on the news media is victims. Everybody's a victim. And the Bible says that you and I should have a victory over victimhood. Now this is very easy uh, to succumb to. Uh, we all are prone to these things. And the reason why we're all prone to these things is because we have this thing called flesh. Okay? And uh, people admire... Um, teams or individuals who overcome great obstacles. Okay, people admire that and they get a victory. They overcome, they admire that. But when an obstacle stands in front of each of them, most of them buckle and collapse under the pressure. Okay, now, uh, I like, I like basketball in particular, sports in particular. I enjoy them. I get a pleasure out of them. Uh, being raised in a farm, uh, the fall time was our slow time, so farm kids usually gravitate towards basketball. Uh, Springtime is uh, planting, so that's baseball, so that's kind of uh, put on second down in the rung of the ladder. But when I play a basketball game, uh, anybody likes a victory in a game. You like to be on the Victoria side. But when I play a game, I'm not just looking at the short-sighted victory I'm not looking at the other team as my great opponent. You know who my greatest opponent is in the game? It's this dude right here. I want to experience a victory after the game, whether the opponent you played, whether you won or lost. I want to experience a victory over my flesh. That I can look at the game and say, okay... I may have uh, suffered uh, offenses from the other team or even from the referees, but at least I came through with my testimony intact. Okay, Pentecostals are tough to play sports. A lot of them lose their salvation in the process. But, <laughs> but uh, what is the normal behavior after a team loses a game is they blame why because I'm a victim. That guy was picking on me. I'm a victim. That's, that's human nature. Which you can figure out how the ref's going to go in the first five minutes and you adjust. Okay, you learn from that. But the most important victory is victory over yourself. 
That's your greatest opponent in life. Now, we're all going to have offenses, and there's, there's fences abound everywhere. Offenses are going to be worse. They're going to increase exponentially as we get closer to the coming of Christ. And a person just, you got to have a victory over victimhood. The emotional pain of discouragement or defeat, it gives you a reality that life is a struggle and life is suffering and that is manifested in a person and life is full of pain and suffering. Why did that happen to me? It's because you're breathing. That's why. Okay, and I'm not, I'm not belittling any suffering or pain or anxiety or problem that people have. And everybody views your, your issue. That's a big thing in your eyes. And I'm not saying it's not to other people. Theirs is bigger because their, their mountain is bigger than your mountain. But we all have these things. And a choice that a person has when you face these offenses is you have a choice to make. What am I going to do? Am I going to succumb to the obstacle and justify myself by becoming a victim? And then I'm going to live a defeated life and wallow, wallow in self-pity and feel justified in that? Or am I going to overcome and experience a victory? Victimhood stifles, stymies any possibility of a victory over the obstacle. Always does. Now, the Lord Jesus, during his life, he would often use opportunities of current events or current experiences, and then he'd use that to teach a lesson. One time, the apostles didn't have enough bread. They only had one loaf of bread for 12 guys. And so Jesus noticed that. He said, oh, hey, by the way, fellas, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they said, huh? how do you know we only had one loaf of bread? And then he said, I'm not talking about bread, you knuckleheads. He said, I'm talking about the leaven of the doctrine of the Pharisees and says. So he took something in their life and was giving them a lesson. Well, one of the fellows brought a newspaper print to Jesus. And, oh, yeah, this is about Pilate offering a sacrifice to the people. Oh, Jesus said, oh, yeah, did you hear about that? Yeah, Pilate, you know, news media is always talking about something murderous or something like that. Pilate murdered all these guys. And, he said, and Jesus said, oh, by the way, except ye repent, ye shall likewise perish. He flipped the newspaper over. Oh, look at here. There was, did you read about that construction job where the, 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 the scaffolding guys didn't have the scaffolding right? And 18 guys fell and got killed. And he said, and if you don't repent, you'll likewise, you'll perish. So the Lord would take current events. Now, I've already broadcast runs from 9 to 9.30 on a little podunk, a large station down the Rensselaer. And... Uh, <laughs> I've been on there for years and years. Started uh, at twenty dollars for thirty minutes, and I at the beginning I put a current events, and I usually hit some hot spot that's in America, and uh, it's usually Muslim sodomy or uh, or the uh, um, abortion agenda. That's that's the big three in America where the, the media is trying to cram that down your throat. Now transgender that goes along with sodomy. And so I usually use that as a topic. And I mean, you have unlimited material on the hypocrisy of the leftists. Unlimited. Now, people that usually tune into the radio, they, they, oh, I like that part. Well, then I shift to the Bible. And I show that the Bible discusses these current events. There's nothing new under the sun. I know what's going to be in the newspaper tomorrow or the next week. I know what the news media is going to do. Why? Because the Bible tells me what they're going to do. And so, Jesus has a different reaction about things, and God has a different reaction. So we have these grave offenses. People have grave offenses. I came across a fellow in, um, in, in, in uh, Australia last time. We got chatting about some things, and then he let me know. He said, I'm an SRA. And, and I knew what he was talking about. Now, SRA means Satanic Ritual Abused. That means he was raised in a satanic family that had sacrifices, human sacrifices and things like that. And he was one that was ritually abused by that family for years. Very kind individual. And I'm thinking that lifestyle, mine, grown up innocently on a farm... Or about the only things I talked to when I did talk was to a dog or a hog. 
I mean, that was my life. Introvert, very quiet. Okay, and I'm looking at that, I'm looking at that, you know. Wow. My problems are not even minuscule compared to that. But everybody's got offenses, and it's going to get worse before we before uh, Christ comes or calls the church out. But the Lord is interested in how we react. That's what he's interested in. God has a plan. <clears throat> he wants his children to be conquerors. Victory. We can get a victory over victimhood and experience a victory. Now I'm going to give you four, three or four ideas about this idea. If you would, try First John chapter 5. <clears throat> It's toward the back of the Bible. We have 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, Revelation. And uh, when a person, when, a, when an individual recognizes the reality of their life, that they're a sinner, <clears throat> and they need a Savior, 1st John chapter 5 shows that the new birth is the first of many victories for the born-again believer. That's the first one. And that is a major victory. But you know, because 99% of the world thinks that religion is the same, and they think that all religion is you're trying to do good, something good to attain heaven, nirvana, utopia, samadhi. <clears throat> but the Bible is different. It's got that something unique about it. First John 5 verse 1, John said this. He said, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that believeth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. If you drop down to verse 4, And whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh, that overcometh the world, even our faith. The vast majority of people have no clue where they're going when they die. The vast majority are flying on an airplane where the pilot doesn't know the destination. And none of them would get on a plane at an airport. If they asked the pilot, where are we going? Ooh, ooh, ooh. But yet they go to a church where the reverend, reverendess, the priest, the rabbi, whoever, you ask them, well, you know where you're going when you die, and they don't got a clue. It is a victory to discover Jesus Christ is a Savior, and I'm putting my faith in Him. That is a victory that a vast minority of people in the world has ever experienced. And a born-again believer has stepped into a different world. Come across the Satanist, which I have done on many occasions, and I just smile and I say, man, you picked the loser. <laughs> We're on the winning side. I read the last chapter. Now, it don't look good. It don't look good for our side right now, but hey, read the last chapter. Skip that all that. Go to the last chapter, man. That's exciting to get back there. Now, all these pagans are trying to appease a God that's always mad, never will not stop getting mad, and they're trying to appease these gods just to temporarily get them to back off. And they offer some sort of sacrifice or do this or do that. And the God is temporarily appeased, but he's never totally appeased. The God of the Bible can be appeased. And it's through his son, Jesus Christ. If you would, Romans chapter 8, verse 31. <clears throat> The God of the Bible <clears throat> is uh, the God of biblical Christianity. Sentence the sinners to condemnation. Yep, that's right. That's what we deserve. But then he says, hey, hey. He said, don't, don't close your ears yet. He said, uh, yeah, you're sentenced to condemnation. You're sentenced to hell. But, 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 Jesus Christ paid the price. He took that sentence for you. And if you place your faith in him and you agree he's the Savior, you place your faith in him, you step into his victory. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What shall we say then? What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Well, a lot of people. Well, it doesn't matter. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Good deal. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. He, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. 
Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also made intercession for Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as is written, for thy sake we are all killed all the day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter? Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. You see, the first victory is believing in Jesus Christ, and that is just one of many. If, if, if we yield to the Spirit in this book. So this, the first thought is the first birth is the or the new birth is the very first of many victories for the born again believer. Second thought is this the agenda of the world. Okay, the world as a body, you can see it really manifested by the leftist agenda is self righteousness promoted through the mentality of victimhood. We're a victim. We've been oppressed. White privilege, male privilege. I mean, that's, that's all it is. All victimhood. Why did Hillary lose? Oh, she's a victim. Don't look in the mirror. No way. Don't look there. Victimhood is the state of being a victim. We have these social justice. They call them lawyers. They're better. They're just as soft as Jello. So, social justice way, rant and rave about being victims of injustice and oppression and racism and homophobia and xenophobia. And when I get talking to these people, I have a Bible and I hold it up and I say, The Bible. I say, Are you a Bible phobic? <gasps> oh, yeah, you are a Bible phobic. What are you, a narrow minded bigot or something? Relax. I mean, and you saw him go crazy. I mean, this, this, this uh, little uh, thing that got elected in New York, uh, what is that little thing that uh, looks to me to be a little transgender, but uh, she's not going to tell us that. You know, she's a victim. It's, oh, she's got the Green Deal. The funniest thing about the Green Deal is they want to get rid of airplane flying, you know, airlines. And a senator in Hawaii... Sign on to the deal. How are you going to get to Hawaii? Train? I mean, th these people are crazy. Who's going to pay for the deal? Not her, or him, or whatever it is. No, they're not going to pay for it. It's somebody else going to pay for it. And it ain't going to get paid for it. It's going to take everything down to tubes. But they're a victim. They deserve it. These people are so ignorant, they don't realize how ignorant they are. And they're smiling, and, and they're so amazing. Oh, this guy who's got a Jewish father and a black mother, and she's an actor. He getting paid six figures, didn't like his salary. So he wrote a check. He wrote a check. When you're going to commit a crime, don't write a check. Wrote a check to two black guys. And then made up the story that he got attacked by two white guys wearing a MAGA hat. And the media jumps all over the story. How terrible. This is 2019. Then the Chicago police figured out the guy's lying. He made it all up. And they found the check he wrote to the two guys. Bonkers. I mean, his kind, I, I'm going to give a couple of illustrations of his kind in the Bible. And I guarantee you, this guy doesn't think he did anything wrong. I guarantee you that guy is still a victim. He is not going to change. That's where the culture is going. Jordan Peterson is in uh, Australia right now. And I've encouraged you to read some of Jordan Peterson. I think the Lord's using these men. I don't think there's, I don't doubt, I doubt they're safe men. But you see, God, he's not going to, the media is not going to let somebody like me get in front of them and start talking. So Jordan Peterson is a guy that I think the Lord has been pointing out these thoughts. He's in Australia. So they got a panel. I don't know if you've seen this. It's a recent one. you got a, you got a, mm, uh, a feminist here. And a conservative politician here, the moderator, another feminist, and then Jordan Peterson, and then a 
Somebody that should have got over it years ago, but a transgender female that transitioned from male to female is almost 70. And a man, it was like, whenever it spoke, it was like, oh, he's been on both sides of the fence. You should have jumped off the fence. And I tell you, he did a masterful job. And it's amazing to hear the questions and the response. And to see the intolerance of the feminist. And how they couldn't keep their mouth shut when these other two were trying to talk. Masterful. I mean, you got to see some of those things. I mean, that, that is just masterful because these people are playing the victim. It's working. How does God respond to that? The Lord's looking from heaven and God Almighty empowers his soldiers on the victory. And eventually he will abandon that victim. He'll drop them like a rock. He'll be patient at first, but then he will drop them like a rock. Don't stay in that victimhood. There's another fellow online. Has anybody ever heard of Larry Elder? Anybody hear of Larry Elder? A couple of you. you got to hear Larry Elder. Get on YouTube. Type in Larry Elder. Uh, Black History Month. Conservative black man. Very articulate. In a 42 minute interview. You type that in. You will learn more about the hypocrisy of the racist agenda in our culture than any time. I mean, he hits it from top to bottom. Very articulate, very fast talker. Amazing guy, Larry Elder. you got to listen to that one. But he is showing, he tells the story of his dad. And how he got mad at his father. And then he realized his dad's story. And talked to his dad for ten years. Then he got his dad's story. And then now he's, he's so close to his father. Great story, amazing story. How to overcome obstacles in life and become a victor. Larry Elder is a definite, I don't know if he's a saved man or not, but boy does he, very, he really hits it good, hits it hard. But you see, God is empowering the soldier on the victory and eventually God abandons the permanent victim. And I'll run some stories in the Bible. A person can choose when you've been offended and I'm not going to belittle any offense. I'm not going to start listing a bunch because offenses abound. It's everywhere. When you start off in the Bible, you have Noah who overcame the world. One man overcame the world and I believe the population before the flood is greater than we have right now. And he overcame the world. What a thing. For a man to do that. Then the next guy that God picked was a guy named Abraham. And Abraham was a wealthy man, but he had no children. And a person says, well, that's not a big deal. It is in that culture not to have a child. And then to get beyond the age of having a child. Then God promising you, you're going to have a child. And then it's not happening. And how many of you should know somebody that's a couple that wanted a child, did everything they could to have a child, tried to have a child, eventually adopted a child, a little baby, and then they had their own baby a year later? I've heard of that many a time. But I'm sure that ate at Abraham and Sarah. They fussed about that many a time. Then Isaac, again, he had the same experience. Now he got a child quicker than Abraham did. And then Jacob, he was a little conniver. But again, he, like his dad and his grandfather, it took a while to get a child. Then he, got, then he got a child. And then he had a bunch of kids. And those bunch of kids, 10, 12 boys, 10 of them, got together and they hated that one brother, Joseph. They just hated that kid. And so dad says, Joe, I want you to go uh, see how your brother's doing. He says, okay, I gets over there. And then the brothers see him coming. And they say, hey, here comes, you know, so-and-so, tattletale. You know, you know, dad's favorite. You know, this guy just gets under my skin. And they said, well, let's just, hey, how about making a little money? So they grabbed him and threw him in a pit. And while he's down there yelling and screaming, begging for them to come out, let, him, let me out, let me out, let me out. There comes a couple of Ishmaelites, you know, the slave traders. And they bought him, took him down to Egypt. No reparations. Joseph never asked for reparations. I don't understand that. <laughs> None whatsoever. 
He goes down to Egypt, away from his family for the first time in his life, a teenage kid. Can you imagine the, the heartbreak he had, the homesickness, the tragedy he went through, the emotions, the pain, the crying himself to sleep at night? Can you imagine what that kid did? And then he gets, but, but he gets serving somebody. I mean, if somebody's a whiner, griper, do you think somebody's going to put them in a position of leadership and start serving? Well, he did. So evidently, he tried to make the best of the world he was given. He tried to blossom where he was at. Well, then, then some woman falsely accuses him. He's in a jail. Thrown in jail. Falsely accused. He's not only in jail. They have him shackled in jail. And according to Psalms, that shackling really hurt his body. And he, but, but he's trying to make the best of his situation, trying to blossom where he's at. And then one of the jailers knows this kid's different than the mother kids, so he put him as a trustee. He started going from place to place. And then he interpreted some, one of the two of those prisoners' uh, dreams, and the both of them came true. And he asked the one, he said, now when you get in front of Pharaoh, hey, would you just kind of let him know that I, you know, I was unjust? And he, you know, hey, put a word in front. I'm tired of this. And the guys forgot about him. A couple years. And then Pharaoh has a couple of dreams, and then, then the guy remembered, and then, and then Joseph comes up, he interprets the dreams, and then Joseph puts is number two in, in charge. The guy blossomed wherever God put him in spite of the offenses. I mean, maybe your, kid, maybe your siblings were pretty bad. Were they as bad as Joseph's? I mean, that's pretty raunchy. Now, when Joshua gets in the land of Canaan, God says, okay, you got 12 tribes, let's, let's divide up the land here. And he said he's divided up the lands. He said, okay, from Manasseh, I want you to give him this plot of ground. Now, Manasseh, they would have been the great, 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 great parent, grandparents of Jesse Smollett. Jewish father, black mother. And when they got their lot, they came to Joshua and they said, we be a great people. We just got a small lot. And Joshua said, Okay, if you're a great people, there it is. Go conquer it. And walk away. <laughs> now, their other brother, Ephraim, or Ephraim, again, another relative of Jesse, that Jewish father, black mother, well, there's a fellow named Jephthah, very rough character, and Jephthah gets in a battle in Judges chapter 11, and in the battle he says, God, if you let me win, I'm going to sacrifice the first thing I see when I come home. And God in heaven is saying, that's not a smart deal, but you made the deal. Okay, here we go. So he wins the battle, he comes home, and there's his daughter, the first thing that walks out. And he foolishly thinks, oh, i got to sacrifice my daughter. And he does. So at, right after he sacrifices his daughter as a sacrifice to God, here come the Ephraimites and said, Why didn't you call us to go out to battle? We would have helped you. And you caught the wrong person at the wrong time. <laughs> and he just got the men of Gilead together and he just beat the royal snot out of those people. He said, I've had it. And why? Because he was so sick of that idea. Victims. God gets sick of that too. David, teenage kid, wins a battle with Goliath. Saul gets jealous of him. And then David becomes a fugitive for years. Running for his life. Couldn't go to the post office because his picture was in there. Everywhere he went. Then you have Daniel. Daniel was a teenage kid, ripped from his home in Judah, transported over to Iraq, Babylon, tried to brainwash him for three years, castrated him, and then he blossomed where he was, overcame those obstacles. Amazing. How about Job? Ten kids, ten caskets in a funeral. Bankruptcy. Then he's in the hospital, loss of health. Job mentions bitterness several times, and I'll come back to Job. But if you go with the first two boys in the Bible, Cain and Abel, 
Cain comes up with the idea is we need to appease God. So I'm going to bring all my, uh, you know, I'm going to bring my turnips and my grapes and all these things in the thing. And of course God's going to accept me because he, he knows who I am. Come on. He, everybody knows who I am. Of course there's only four of us, but you know, everybody knows who I am. And, um, and Abel's thinking, okay, i, I got a lamb. I'll offer the lamb for sacrifice. So Cain's over there jumping up and down, doing about his thing. You know, crisscrossing himself back and forth, you know, several times. And then Abel's over here offering a lamb, and lightning comes down. <coughs> accepts Abel's sacrifice. And Cain's over there, and he's, whoa, what was that big noise? And Abel's running around, like, all excited because God accepted him. And Cain's over there, who do you think you are? Think you raided everybody else around? I don't know about that, Cain. I just don't God accepted. I'm surprised he kind of did. Well, he should have accepted mine. Don't he know who I am? I was born this way. This is what I think I am. He should accept me. And God came down and said, Cain, what you so mad about? Well, I, you know, I should be mad. He said, there's a lamb right over there. Sin lies the door. Why don't you go get it? I mean, it worked for him. Why don't you try it? I'm just as good as he is. Well, maybe you are, but why don't you try that lamb, Cain? Why don't you try that? Don't you know who I am? Uh, of course I know who you are. You know, you're the oldest, you know, all that stuff. But why don't you, come on, why don't you do something about it? No way, I'm not going to do it. You're just a bloody religion, that's all you are. My way is good. And so Abel's out there uh, tending his sheep, and he's just whistling away because, man, God accepted my sacrifice. I'm amazed. He's whistling away, and Cain's over and stinking jerk. He goes over and gets in a fight with him, kills him. God shows up. He said, hey, Cain, where's your brother? Oh, my, my brother's keeper? He said, well, in fact, you are. You're the oldest. You should be taking care of your brother. Where's he at? Well, I don't know. You know, the Lord says, you know, I hear some blood crying over there. Yeah, I hear that. Oh, you killed your brother, didn't you? Well, he deserved it. I can't believe he got me so mad. It's his fault. I'm a victim. And God says, okay, pal, I'm going to blackball you, and you're done. You're going to be a fugitive of a vagabond. Oh, my punishment's greater than I can bear. A whiny little gripey punk. And God left him. God don't put up with that. He gave him a chance. And you'll find that not only with Cain and Abel, you'll find that with Ishmael and Isaac. You'll find that with Jacob and Esau. Now Esau is quite a character. When a man gets bitter, he don't think right. Jacob, why did you need a blessing? Well, first off, God said it when you're born. If you don't like it, take it up with God. Well, okay, I will. And so he took it up with God. And he got bitter about that. He said, you stole my birthright. Uh, no, I didn't. You stole it. Don't you remember that night? You were so tired. You were famished. You came home. I had some lentils in the pot. You know, and you said, my, that birthright ain't worth a hill of beans to me. So, you stole it to me. You stole it. No, you sold it. No, you stole it. Well, you're a deceiver. Yeah, I probably am. But you sold it to me. No, I didn't. You stole it. Back and forth. You're not going to convince a victim. No way to convince them. And then Saul and David. After David wins the battle with Goliath, Saul should have been happy. He saved my life. But no, he got the attention that I wanted. And that's how it goes. Offenses are going to increase exponentially in the latter days until we face Christ. How are we going to respond? God empowers a soldier on a victory. But God eventually will abandon the permanent victim. And the last thought is this. We need to conquer bitterness. How do we conquer bitterness against God? Bitterness is always directed at God. Even though we may direct it at a person... It goes beyond the person to God. Because God allowed that. That's what Adam did with Eve. When, when God caught her with Eve, he's, God said, what would you do, Adam? He said, it was that woman you gave me. He blamed God. You see, you need to conquer our bitterness against God by childlike faith and beg God for grace. Several years ago, 
Through the years we've been here, 20, 21 years, going on 22 years, a couple different situations, two adult leaders in the church here went after Heidi. They went after her unjustly. I investigated it, figured it out. It was unjust what both leaders did two separate times. We did not come to her defense. We did not go to the leaders at all. We taught, we worked with Heidi to say, okay, I agree. I, I researched it. Yes, it was unjust what they did, but you got to learn from it. Would she have learned anything if we went to her defense, as a lot of parents do? I'm not saying you shouldn't. There are times you need to do that. We did not feel that was necessary in this time. We felt it was something that a young person needs to recognize. The leader is not always right. You maintain respect, but they're not always right. So you learn from it. you got to learn from that. And so she learned from it. And she blossoms where she's at. Okay? Conquer bitterness against God by childlike faith and trust. If you would, look in Hebrews 12. I mentioned Esau. It says that Esau wept bitterly. <clears throat> he wept bitterly after Isaac blessed Jacob. Now, unfortunately... <clears throat> Rebecca, she did wrong, she lost faith. And unfortunately, she suffered a very bad thing because she lost faith. When she sent Jacob away, she never saw him again. 20 years. She evidently died in there. Terrible thing. But it, but it says Esau wept bitterly. Hebrews 12, 15. Here we got a, thousand, a couple thousand years later and the Bible keeps accurate records. Esau. Looking diligently, Hebrews 12, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. See, the Bible accounts that he sold it. But a bitter person runs this over in their mind. And they're right and you're wrong. Why? They're a victim. Why did they do that to me? Why did they do that to me? Over and over. Why did God allow that to happen? Why did God allow that to happen? Over and over and over. And he got bitter. The opportunity, verse 15, was grace. Beg God for grace. Beg God for grace. If you would, try Job 21, <clears throat> verse 25. <clears throat> now, from a human lay perspective... From a natural perspective, if anybody had a reason to be bitter, Job would have fit the bill. I had many a guy in jail tell me, I understand what Job went through. And I'll look at him and say, uh, <coughs> Job is not suffering for a DUI. No, you don't understand what Job went through. <laughs> don't even try. <laughs> But Job, the word bitter is mentioned five times by Job. Five times. And if anybody were justified being bitter, that's the man who would be justified. From a humanly perspective. Job 21, 25, he said this. And another dieth in bitterness of his soul, and never eateth with pleasure. There's the heartache of bitterness. You can't enjoy anything. You just over and over in your mind run through the offense. And Job said, I'm not dying that way. And that's why Job said, Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. And Job is going to be an illustration to people in the tribulation time period. James 5 verse 11. And I'm sure Job, when he read James 5 verse 11, when he read that account, when he got to heaven, read that, now I see why you did what you did. Why didn't you tell me that? The Lord says, because I wanted you to have faith. He's going to be an example to Jewish people in the tribulation. James 5 verse 11. The Spirit of God allows 
or gives grace to the believer to overcome bitterness. Ephesians 4 verse 30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. And the next verse, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. We grieve our God when we run it over and maintain our bitterness against God. Now if we go back to Joseph. If anybody had a reason to be bitter against their siblings, he would fit the bill. Okay, humanly, naturally speaking, he would fit the bill. God gave him a dream saying, someday your brother's going to bow down to you. As a teenage kid, he probably shouldn't have told his brothers, but man, you have a dream, you want to tell somebody. They got mad about it. They got jealous, they got envious. That's what prompted them to sell him into slavery. That's what prompted them to lie to their dad for over a decade. When their dad would be crying in the room, there they are in the other room knowing that he wasn't dead. They didn't know what happened to him. They didn't tell their dad. They hid that from their dad for over a decade. And then here they show up down there in Egypt and there's Joseph and they never recognized. They had no clue what happened to him. And as they're squabbling amongst each other because Joseph is putting a test on them, they're squabbling and they're, that, what they did is eating at them. It's been eating at them ever since they did it. And they even bring it up. We shouldn't have done that to Joseph. And Reuben said, I told you you shouldn't have listened to me. We heard his crying. We heard his crying. And we shouldn't have done that to him. And Joseph is listening. He ran into another room and wept. All the emotions came out. He wept because of the pain he had. But he saw the big picture. And when he manifested himself to his brothers, he said, don't be angry with yourself. God has sent me before. He saw the big picture. He was a victor. He wasn't a victim. The big picture. God wants us to be victors, overcome great obstacles in life, so we can help others overcome their obstacles. Well, these boys, man, they were excited that Joseph forgave them, but in their heart they're thinking, ah, did he really forgive us? I, and they got thinking, he forgave us, but the re maybe he did, but... He's not going to do anything because dad's alive. He won't do anything to us because he will not hurt his dad. We know his love for his dad. If he came down hard on us, if he came down hard on us, it would hurt dad. And he would not do anything to hurt dad. Well, dad dies. In their mind. In their mind. Oh, now we're going to get it. We're going to get it. So they conjured up a story. I don't think it happened, but they conjured up a story. And they said, Joe, uh, Nep Nepania, whatever his name was. <laughs> he said, uh, uh, we talked to Dad. Oh, you did? Yeah, Dad was telling us, would you forgive us for what we did? There's no record of that. They made it up. They were afraid. Justly so. This guy could throw him in prison. This guy could have him beheaded right on the spot. And he said, forgive? Already did. You know the first time the word forgive is found in the Bible is right there, Genesis 50 verse 17 with Joseph. What a conqueror. What a conqueror. The grace of Joseph is more a type of Christ than anybody in the Old Testament. And when he saw his Savior, he said, oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad you gave me the grace to do that. You see, he's a victor. We can conquer. We can conquer bitterness against God by a childlike faith. And God will give us the grace. Yeah, a person can choose to stay a victim. But you know what's happening? God's leaving. He's sick of it. He'll put up with it temporarily. But then God will go away because we will grieve the Spirit of God. Now, I know we have eternal security. But that influence will fade away. Because who wants to be around a griper, complainer, a bitter individual? God doesn't. And so he won't do it. So we can be more than conquerors. We got a victory right off the bat by salvation and sanctification. 
so that we can be continual conquerors of Jesus Christ by conquering bitterness against God. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I do pray you'd help each and every one of us to be more than conquerors. By chance, if somebody in this room is not born again, help them realize they could start a life of victory by coming to Jesus Christ by faith. But that doesn't mean everything's going to be all hunky-dory. Now we're a soldier in an army, and a soldier gets shot at. And Lord, there are a lot of offenses. Lord, we beg for your grace to overcome these obstacles and these offenses so that we can bask in the victory that you have available. Well, heads about an eyes are closed. The piano will play. The altar's open if you'd like to use it. Praise be to God who giveth us the victory. But that giving us the victory will be giving grace <clears throat> so that we can march forward into the victory. He wants us to make sure that we remain soldiers. Lord, I do pray. I thank you for the victory of salvation. Thank you that we can be more than conquerors. And thank you that you've had a victory over the devil and death. Lord, I pray you'd help us to have a victory over discouragement, depression, and even bitterness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.